Uh, thanks for joining me today. So today is going to be a little different than kind of what I've normally done uh, with live streams in the past. Uh, this one uh, is going to be discussing uh, five books uh, about the Battle of Hong Kong, Canada's role in it, uh, how they the came. The past. Uh, this one. Uh, sorry about that. How they came to. Uh, how sorry. How the Canadians came to reinforce um, the British colony. How. Um, the, how the POW years were spent, all that kind of stuff. So these books touch on all of that uh, in different ways uh, and, and, and in different perspectives. So I think these five um, speak to uh, the areas that they cover fairly well uh, as far as we have in terms of books out there on the battle. So for those, excuse me, for those of you who don't know me or anything about me, I just recently completed my PhD in history uh, on the Battle of Hong Kong and Canada's role uh, within it. So, and that took the form of looking at uh, how the battle is remembered in Canada, uh, how that came to be, um, and all the different players that kind of had roles uh, in forming the memory of the battle, uh, how it's perceived, and even today with uh, events memorials and that kind of thing. So to, for that, I had to kind of frame that in, in a way uh, which was more difficult than I initially anticipated. So kind of what I did is I looked at various myths uh, surrounding the battle, uh, the reinforcement and, and the POW years and, and, and all that kind of stuff uh, and how the veterans retreated afterwards and that kind of thing. Uh, so I looked at those. So I needed to use a wide variety of sources, primary, secondary, um, both were equally important, right? Because this is all about um, how memories are formed and, and how we remember things. So uh, I looked at all different kinds of things. I looked at memoirs from veterans uh, who fought um, all the books basically I could get uh, that had been written on the battle in English. Anyway, uh, I only speak English. Uh, well enough uh, to do at this level. Uh, so I looked at all those kinds of sources. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, as some of you might be watching, uh, might be aware, there's only so many. There's hardly any out there. Uh, particularly kind of looking at the Canadian role from beginning to end, focusing on that without kind of taking a polemic, argumentative, uh, or just outright nasty biased opinion of Canadians or who, you know, was responsible for all the things that happened or, you know, who should be blamed and all that kind of thing. So there's all kinds of issues that I'm sure I'll just talk about as I move along. Uh, so the first book, um, and you can see the list in the description below. Uh, check that out because I'll, I'll go in that order. So it's roughly chronological, uh, roughly, uh, and then kind of divided from there. So the first one, um, sorry, it's a bit hard to see because I don't have the dust jacket. I don't think I ever did. Uh, so this is Hong Kong Eclipse by uh, Endicott. So it's a bit older. It's from 1978. Uh, so a lot of work has been done uh, on the battle uh, since then, obviously, including myself and others, uh, you know, kind of the, the people I stand on the shoulders of. But uh, this one is uh, still recommended uh, to be read because it covers the whole period. So of all the Second World War uh, of... Uh, of Hong Kong. So it's not just the battle or the POW years or the Canadians or what have you. There's more to it than that. Um, so uh, I highly recommend it um, as a starting point in a sense. Sorry, I'm just noticing. I think my lens is a little dirty. Get that off there. It's not coming off. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, so sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's more general. Um, it looks at all the different stuff. Um, as much was available in the 70s, right? Because things had changed. Um, talking about how things led to the war with Japan, um, kind of um, Hong Kong's role within that. Um, and, but, you know, the plans for defense, which again, there's been a ton of work done on uh, since this point, um, including for myself. So I think this is a, a good place to start, but to keep in mind um, that much has been done. Uh, much has changed. Uh, there's new sources. Things have changed in Hong Kong itself. Events have uh, transpired that have changed the way people in Hong Kong, outside Hong Kong, view the battle. I mean, of course, there's um, uh, the British exit from Hong Kong, and that has kind of changed how these things are now viewed in a different way in a lot of ways, um, because there's that less of a British sort of 
connection to the island for a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of people who are writing on this stuff um, had a connection uh, to the old Hong Kong, I'll call it, you know, the British Hong Kong um, before the handover. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting um, to get a sense of this. This is very much a historiography kind of thing, you know, look at um, why um, th this way is viewed this way. And I think it's a good starting point. Uh, it's a good use for academics as well, or anyone kind of studying at that level, uh, undergrads, uh, graduates, anything. It's a good look uh, because there's just, unfortunately, like I already said, there's hardly anything that takes this sort of format. Um, looking at Hong Kong, there is another book, um, which I unfortunately don't have a copy of, uh, but I can put a description. I can put it in the link below. Uh, it's called Eastern Fortress. It looks at all of Hong Kong's military history, so that's a good one too. But it's not just what I wanted to talk about today. So it's a good one too, but it, it, it's new. Um, -ish. It's a couple years old now, uh, but it was central to what I did too. But this one is Hong Kong Second World War, so it's it's a very good one to use to get a kind of rough idea, but uh, like I'll probably say with a good chunk of all of these works, I think, actually, uh, take it with a grain of salt because of its age, um, but it's still a useful source. I used it in my dissertation that I submitted a couple months ago, as some of you know. So it's something to definitely keep in mind. If you're interested in this topic, it, it, it's worth reading for the general uh, reader who's interested in Second World War, Hong Kong, the war in the East, Far East, sorry. Uh, it's a good one to kind of start off looking at... Um, the general areas. But again, it, it's a bit older uh, and there was some uh, veteran influence on this one as well. But I don't want to kind of talk about that because I don't want to spoil everything about these books because the, I do think they're worth looking at. Um, so you should be able to find this one. I don't know if it's in print anymore. I don't think so. Uh, I found mine online through a used source, uh, used book source. Uh, so look there. That's probably your best bet. Uh, I don't think the prices were too, too bad because I think there was a pretty good print run uh, originally. So you should be able to find something. Uh, but I highly recommend it if if you are interested in it. Uh, hey, Willie, how are you? Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, if you have any questions, fire away. Don't, uh, don't worry about that. Um, this is, again, going to be a relaxed chat talking about books in Hong Kong. So fire away. Uh, so that's kind of the first one I wanted to start with. It's probably the oldest one I have um, that kind of does this general view. Um, I don't think there's any others that kind of do this. Uh, so it, it's it's uh, it's a good place to start, uh, would be my argument. Uh, and I don't think any, I think other people have said that as well. Tony Bannon, who we'll talk about later, who knows tons about this stuff, uh, uh, recommends it as well. So I, I would say uh, it's a good place to start. So the next two um, are memoirs. Uh, those formed uh, a very uh, early part of what uh, I was doing, how I was looking at this battle, how I was trying to understand it. Um, because we have all kinds of sources that look at the battle, but they are hugely problematic, um, particularly the older ones uh, from the 1960s. There's a few um, that are just so problematic, they're not even worth looking at. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the negative today, unless I'm asked. Uh, so the first one is, um, and now these are in chronological order, separated by a year, actually. So this one, sorry, is uh, William Allister's uh, Where Life and Death Hold Hands. Uh, highly, highly recommend this one. It's probably, and uh, this might be controversial, I think it's the best memoir of the Pacific War. It, yeah, it's a big claim to make, um, particularly with the American memoirs out there. I'm talking about the entire war, 41, 45. This is probably my top. Yes, of course, I'm biased. I, I recognize that. Uh, but I've read uh, Sledges. Um, he was with the 1st Marine Division, uh, Robert Leckie's as well. Uh, so these are probably the tops in the English world. I mean, there's others uh, I haven't had a chance to read. But from combat soldiers, this one is probably at the top for me. Uh, and why it's at the top. Uh, is because of everything, not just the topic, um, the descriptions, the writing style. I mean, Lucky's writing style is excellent as well. Uh, it's just a little different. Uh, and Sledge is just visceral. But um, Alistair's is, is kind of like a mix of both with a more of an artistic flair. Um, because if, if you don't, aren't aware, William Alistair was an artist um, in the post-war years. Um, very, very good painter, incredible painter. His works still are very well known. Uh, very expensive. Of course, I'd love to get one, but they are, are quite pricey. Uh, but his his writing um, 
is clearly showing that this was a man who should have been nowhere near a battlefield. And I'm not saying that because he was a coward or he didn't do his job well. Uh, arguably, I would say the complete opposite. He did his job extremely well uh, and fought extremely well, uh, considering the circumstances he was under. Uh, it's just he's not the type of man, and, and he's unfortunately passed away. Uh, but I, I don't think I'm the first one to say this either, uh, is he's not the type of person who should be at war on the battlefield. Uh, his others, He has other skills that could have been useful in other ways, uh, and just his way of the world and the, what his past experiences were uh, just were not uh, what you would think of as even a typical warrior in any way, shape or form. Uh, but with that said, um, what it did result in, and probably the only good thing, and then of course his incarceration as a POW and the war battle that only lasted two or so weeks had a huge effect on him for the rest of his life. Um, but we didn't get a memoir out of this. Um, he wrote it later. Uh, the book is from 1989, uh, published in 1989, sorry. So uh, it's very much later, like a lot of the memoirs are. Uh, they don't come out until much later, which is a general trend, Second World War memoirs. Um, could because people were working, didn't want to talk about it. Um, older age means people want to talk more about it, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's what you see here. Now, I haven't got to go into any kind of detail about Alistair's past other than his memoir and kind of what others had written about it. I saw his files at the Canadian War Museum. Uh, but they are basically his notes uh, for the book. So I haven't really dug any deeper. Uh, but again, I still recommend his memoir. Uh, buy it, read it, uh, own it. Uh, anyone who's interested in the war in the Pacific should read this. I mean, his accounts are, um, like I said, visceral. Um, he talks. The thing that stuck with me through my entire uh, dissertation, and I read this years and years ago now, was his first use of the rifle. Uh, he outright describes killing uh, two men. Um, and that stuck with him, I think, for the rest of his life. Um, he uh, was in line under attack, and he opens up and and, and has two kills. Um, and, and, and it stuck, sticks with him because in the memoir, um, after years of incarceration as a POW, and the stories in the POW years, of course, are... Um, heartbreaking. Uh, there's some humor as these things tend to happen in all the numerous uh, memoirs and books I've read uh, uh, about the various POWs. Uh, it's got that as well. Um, the descriptions of things that happen to survive are, are shocking, um, amazing at the same time. Uh, so sorry, anyway, so yeah, so towards the end of um, the war, uh, and after the Japanese surrender, actually, uh, the Americans finally get uh, to Alistair um, to liberate him and out of the camps. Uh, but uh, the Japanese uh, guards are still around uh, where where Alistair is. Uh, and he describes a U.S. Um, soldier, I believe, or it could have been a Marine, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, or, or uh, a sailor, I can't remember. Anyway, they're going into a room where there's two Japanese guards, and they were going to open up on them and, and, and take them out. Uh, and Alistair describes stopping him. So, and he says then and there, uh, you know, I took two lives, I saved two, uh, kind of thing. So that obviously had stuck with him through all of this. All he had been through the years of starvation, uh, disease, incarceration, poor treatment, uh, everything. Um, uh, is very interesting that, that that's what sticks with him. Uh, so that's, to me, is kind of what is... Uh, got that kind of visceral nature to it is, is that this episode sticks with him for decades um, and again his writing is top notch uh his descriptions of things uh i was shocked in a not in a you know kind of a grotesque or any kind of way but i've just never seen these things described in this way uh particularly about the battle right because i've read primary accounts you know diaries that kind of thing that barely mention the battle uh, that's why i looked at so many of them i looked at as many as i could find uh, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, kind of get the, the the soldier's perspective of the fighting, right? Because there's no after-action reports. The war diaries are done after the fact with very little input from the other ranks because the other ranks were separated from the officers and the POW camps. Uh, so we have that going on. Uh, that's an element of this. I mean, yes, the Canadians were, were together, uh, but a lot of the senior leadership was not. Uh, they are the ones writing the war diaries. So that is kind of uh, problematic if you're trying to look at the battle as best you can. 
so that's why I turned to the memoirs because I was like, what else do I have? Right. Because most of the veterans had passed away uh, and getting their accounts of the battle is very difficult. Um, so that, that, that's part of this. Uh, but anyway, so, so Alistair's memoir is, is, is one to be read. Um, I should say at the beginning, he was a signaler. He wasn't part of the, um, the two infantry battalions that were sent. He was part of the headquarters section. Um, and he was a conscript, which I think is very interesting. I did not know that until I really started to do a very close read of the memoir because um, he mentions um, being conscripted uh, and then kind of doing what that is at the time, training, that kind of thing. The details are kind of sketchy in his book. Uh, but he mentions, you know, the kind of idea uh, of going active. Uh, and and that's how he ends up in Hong Kong because he's kind of bored as he describes it. Because uh, again, he's this artistic, he worked as a comedian. I mean, I'm sure the army life is not the, the most exciting for someone like that. Um, so he wanted to do something else other than just sitting around. So he goes active um, and then volunteers to be part of the headquarters section to go to Hong Kong. Because uh, there's rumors about all that kind of stuff and where they're going to go and what it is. I mean, it's getting out of Canada. Uh, so that's kind of uh, kind of what he describes. Uh, so it, it's very interesting because, I th and I did want to mention this specifically, uh, because I do have an interest in conscription. Uh, my grandfather was a conscript in the Second World War. My great-grandfather was a conscript in the First World War. Uh, neither saw combat, but they were still conscripted. So that's very interesting to me. And kind of there's always this talk in Canada about, yes, our volunteer is, or sorry, our army uh, is largely volunteer. I'm not dis just disputing that whatsoever. Uh, but it's a very complicated topic. It's not just, yes, so, you know, all these people volunteered for war. Uh, that's not quite clear of why a lot of them did. How many of them were actually conscripted before the fact? We don't know a lot about that because the records are sketchy. Oh, hi, Angela. Thanks for joining me. It's much appreciated. Uh, no worries about being late. I'm glad to have you here at any time. Uh, I said this when Willie jumped on board, but uh, if you have any questions or going too fast or whatever, just uh, fire away. Be happy to talk about it. So, uh, yeah, sorry. So back to um, Alistair. Yeah, so he's a conscript, uh, goes active, uh, and then is in a battleground. The first of the Canadian Army, right? Second World War is, is Hong Kong. Uh, so he's a signaler, so he's the one in charge of communications. Uh, so he does his job as well as one can under these circumstances. I mean, all the signalers uh, are mentioned as doing an excellent job. Uh, and they don't just support the Canadians on the island. They, um, they uh, are on the mainland as well, which is a, a, not a big part of the Canadian Battle of Hong Kong. Uh, the Canadians uh, defend the island. Uh, and that you can see, sorry, just give me a second here. Um, oh, I had it. Uh, anyway, so sorry, I don't have the the, uh, the file loaded up, but uh, uh, it, it, it's 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 easy to find uh, if you want to pull that up. Uh, anyway, so so yeah, they do their job very well. All the signalers, Alistair included, all his friends, who are also a large number of them. Um, and there's only so many of them. I can't remember the number of top of my head, but it's not more than twenty or so. Uh, our conscripts as well. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's a part that's not talked about. I, I think it deserves a place. There's other conscripts here that go active, as the saying goes. Uh, so Dan Byers wrote on this. Uh, I can put the link to the book down below after. Uh, I didn't really think about it that deeply, but uh, but it's uh, something I, I think is important. And, and Alistair's story touches on that. Uh, I think it's an area that deserves more attention. Is ripe for scholarly research. If anyone out here watching is trying to get some ideas, uh, that's one. So, so, so that's Alistair's story. I don't want to give away too many details because that would just kind of, I think, ruin it. Because it's a memoir, I can't tell his story better than he could. Uh, so anyway, that's a definite one to find. Uh, I don't think it's in print anymore. Uh, so you have to try and find and use it again like I mentioned for Endicott's book, um, use source, uh, like a used uh, books website or something like that, or the libraries, a lot of them have it because it's a fairly, he's fairly well known. So it uh, should be pretty easy to find. So the next memoir, which is equally as important and is also a very another unique story is, uh, it's called The Guest, this one actually I have a title book on here, here. The Guest of Hirohito, who was the Japanese emperor at the time, Kenneth Cavon. Who later became a doctor, a medical doctor after the war. Um, 
again, that's a unique part of this story because he serves with the sorry, there's a bit of glare. I don't have good lighting in my in my office. Um, but anyway, yeah. So sorry, he fights with the Royal Rifles. Uh, he's the youngest member of the Royal Rifles. Uh, so he he just a regular, you know, the poor bloody infantry uh, who uh, becomes a POW uh, and then ends up working as an orderly in one of the hospitals, uh, Bowen Road, I believe, uh, which is run uh, under the British command, uh, but under Japanese, I'll say oversight. I can't think of another word. That's not really accurate because things are not good. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, the POW years uh, were absolutely brutal uh, for the Canadians, the Brits, the Indians, uh, the local Hong Kong volunteers that were all made POWs uh, after the garrison falls uh, to the Japanese attack on Christmas Day, 1941. Uh, so, so Cabon's story is part of that as well. Um, the, the, the issues in the hospitals, the lack of basic medical care because the Japanese refuse in numerous ways outright to give proper equipment, proper um, uh, like, you know, uh, serums to help things. Uh, they just outright refuse bandages are almost non-existent. No surgical equipment, none of that stuff. So anyway, so going back to the beginning uh, of Cabin's story. So he's in the Royal Rifles. Uh, so he, they fight on the uh, predominantly eastern side of the island. Uh, so that's where his story kind of lies uh, in the battle. It's very short. Um, like, again, like, oh, the Battle of Hong Kong on the island lasts less than a couple of the days, like six days or so um, for the most of them. Uh, and it's difficult fighting, uh, very difficult fighting. But they do their best. And I think they do better than you would probably expect if you just were like, say, hey, here's all these details. If you didn't know anything other than context, you know, other than the numbers and the Japanese army had been fighting in China, a good portion of it since 1931, against these Canadians who have not seen battle ever, or some haven't since 1918, and are a bit older, uh, it's not going to go well. And in a lot of cases, it did not go well. I'm not saying that that's not what happened, but but we have this perception that it was completely terrible, or they did terrible, terrible work, and, and that's just not the case. Uh, so Cabon has a lot of good stories as well. His writing style is different, very different from Alistair's, very much straightforward, uh, which is appreciated by me in a different way. I uh, use Cabon's as the first I think I read. I think it was the first memoir I had read very closely. Um, I think I read it twice over uh, about the battle, of uh, Canadian experience in the battle. Um and in the POW years, sorry, I keep forgetting to mention that because it wasn't my focus on my dissertation, but uh, it's just as equally important, if not more so. Uh, so just because of the length, uh, the battle's only a couple of days, the POW years is years. Uh, so that's another important point to be making. Uh, but anyway, sorry about that. So Cabon uh, is, uh, gives descriptions uh, of basically being a teenager at war. And, and, and it's heartbreaking in a lot of ways. I mean, I can remember being 17, as he was, and just the difficulties uh, that he faces. And the best way to say it is he had to grow up real fast. Uh, like, there's a point where he describes, you know, complaining, right? Because it's so difficult. They have to march constantly. They're constantly on the move, attacking, sorry, counterattacking, withdrawing, counterattacking, withdrawing, moving locations, being full, you know, being pushed back by the Japanese attacks, that kind of thing. So at one point, kind of, you know, Cabon's complaining about this uh, outright to the small section he's with uh, and, you know, complaining about, you know, this isn't going to end well or this is not going great. Um, I should have written this down beforehand. I forget the name. But again, it's, a, it's something I don't want to really ruin about the book. But he's basically, you know, as he thinks, he says something along the lines of, I was put in line, smartened up uh, by one of the senior uh, NCOs. And he says that saved his life uh, because he, uh, like, I guess the best way to say it is you had to grow up real fast and kind of what he was going through. You know, you got to keep pushing. Um, a lot of this is mental uh, coming. This is, again, my perceptions coming from reading memoirs and diaries and reports and all this stuff. It's all, it's a mental battle. Um, keep fighting. Don't give up. Uh, it was a lot of, a lot of that. The ones who had just given up uh, die, particularly in the camps. Uh, and that's across memoirs. 
Um, all kinds of people talk about this. Uh, friends of theirs or people they knew all of a sudden just kind of gave up and then that's when they died. Um, so it's just a kind of a perseverance and, and, and Kevin's story is a lot of that. He perseveres and I, and I, and I think his, his story well after the war is, is very important to know uh, because he becomes a medical doctor. That that's, that's massive. You know what I mean? He comes from a 17 year old rifleman to becoming a medical doctor for decades and then advancing through his profession. Uh, and he mentions this in his work that he was able to do so because of the support given uh, by the Canadian government uh, after the fact. Uh, he's just outright surprised that they'll be like, oh, they'll pay for my schooling. Cool. Uh, and they'll give me a wage, uh, a small one, but they'll give me a wage on doing this so I can do this. And, and this is something I did want to mention uh, connected to Cabon's story. Yes, the Veterans Charter is important in Canada. I'm not denying that whatsoever. It's one of the best in the Allied nations after the war. Um, I think that's uh, very much worth noting. Uh, but with that said, I think the veterans, and I argue this in my dissertation, I think I've argued this elsewhere, uh, the veterans of Hong Kong were not treated as well as they could have been. There's a lot of uniqueness to their situation. Uh, that comes from literally the diseases they faced. The malnutrition, the lack of vitamins causes all kinds of problems. And the tropical diseases um, are, are unknown. And I don't often say that. I don't speak in these kinds of absolutes, but they are unknown by the Canadian medical profession, uh, 1945 and onwards. Um, it's, it, it's something they have to face. Uh, and the doctors don't really know what to do. And, and some of them are quite callous. Uh, there's portions of my, my dissertation where I talk about this and straight up from Veterans Affairs doctors. Uh, and the one that struck me the most was um, the treatment of mental health. A lot of people within Veterans Affairs, um, Department of National Defense, saw this Hong Kong survivors as complainers. That they wanted more, they were taking more than they were, you know, owed. Uh, which is unfortunate. Um, there's a, a letter uh, coming across, uh, I came across that just kind of stuck with me, uh, saying that the mental health issues are to be ignored. They think there's a physical cause. Um, once those are fixed, it should be fine. I think they literally use the word lesions on the nervous system. Uh, to me, that's just quite ignorant uh, of the situation. Uh, and I'm not speaking from today's terms. I'm speaking in 1945 terms. Uh, they had known that there was a mental impact uh, on, on the soldiers. Uh, and being a POW is no different. Um, you're still facing danger, especially in the hands of the Japanese, every day. I mean, there's literal beatings, uh, executions, uh, mountain treatment. Uh, they're made to work in shipping yards, coal mines, um, and the like, which are extremely dangerous. No health and safety standards whatsoever. Um, guys die painting ships, that kind of thing. Uh, so to me, the, they said this uh, in the post immediate post-war period is, is, is outright lunacy to me. Sorry, lunacy is not a good word. Um, ignorance, um, callousness, uh, that they don't think that there's a mental component to this. Uh, and there is. I mean, Kevin mentions in his book that he doesn't really suffer from that. Um, I've got to take his word for it, right? Because what else do we have? He's also unfortunately passed away. Uh, quite a number of years ago. Uh, so we don't have anything else to go on. Uh, but I know many of the veterans suffered um, years after the war. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, mentally, physically. Um, and they did not receive the support that they should have from the Canadian government. Uh, I argue this goes on for decades. And I argue that that still has impact today. Um, the Canadian government didn't really want to commemorate Hong Kong in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and I think it's because it was a defeat. It's an embarrassment. They're embarrassed. Uh, and this, I'm not talking just about King government or those in his immediate successors, Saint Laurent, uh, all those different departments. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about everybody. I'm talking about even up to today. Uh, this is still going on uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, yes, there is a Hong Kong memorial, but the Canadian government had nothing to do with it. Yeah, they gave them some land. whoop de doo Sorry, using formal language there. Uh, but they gave them trouble. They said it wasn't innovative enough. Um, uh, you know, that they said the memorial wasn't good enough. It didn't blend in with the buildings. You can't even see the buildings from the memorial. So I think, again, it's just more trouble. 
uh, again, I want to do more work on that later because it's not public information, but I just, to me, it seems like excuses. Uh, oh, good question, Willie. Um, didn't suffer or hit it well. Um, again, I never knew um, Cam on the man, if you're talking about him directly. Uh, never met him. Uh, all I have is go on is his books. I looked, there's a few letters here and there. Um, as far as I can tell, he was okay. Uh, mentally, he may have had some issues. I don't know. Again, I can't speak for the man. Uh, but generally, um, a lot of them hit it or tried to, as I should say. I'm sorry, this will be a bit of a digression off a of book topic, but it's important to talk about. Um, they they tried to hide it. A lot of them did not. Um, alcoholism was rampant in the Hong Kong veterans. Rampant. Um, and I'm, this is not a blame. This is not a moral failing or whatever you want to call it. They tried to cope and they couldn't. Uh, a lot of them talk about having trouble readjusting. Cabon talks about that and he says he was fine. Uh, Alistair talks about that in length. He has all kinds of trouble. Uh, he doesn't think people can understand him anymore. He doesn't understand what's happening uh, in the civilian world. He has difficulty, maybe never adjusted ever again. Um, and I mean, this isn't just even Hong Kong. This is an experience uh, for all kinds of veterans. Canadian, American, British, German, Soviet, what have you. Uh, they have all kinds of issues. Uh, and, and I think a lot of them tried to hide it. A lot of them uh, didn't. Uh, I've only spoken, I've spoken to one veteran, uh, George McDonnell, great guy. Uh, I didn't want to ask him about the post-war years because uh, I only had a limited time and I had a, kind of an assignment I was focusing on. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I've spoken to numerous children of veterans. I don't know how many at this point, a lot, um, a lot, a lot. Uh, they, uh, there's all kinds of stories. I hear all kinds of stories of, of um, I'm not going to name any names or anything, of uh, alcoholism, an inability to hold a job, um, that kind of thing. Like, it goes on for years. I think one talked about his father bouncing around jobs all the time. I couldn't really work. Um, another one talked about how his father was actually quite successful in what he was trying to do. I think it was construction or something along those lines or construction consulting or something. Uh, but even he had difficulty focusing, staying in the job, uh, despite being, you know, was termed successful. So, so, so there's that element to it. Um, yeah, I, uh, I agree, Angela. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, sorry there, just give me a second. So yeah, I agree. That's a really good point. Uh, yeah, I mean, that still goes on today. Uh, I tried to include that in the dissertation. Uh, certain individuals didn't like it. Um, so I took that part out. But it goes on through to today. I think that's one of the lessons that can be taken from this. Is we shouldn't expect people to hide this trauma. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't end well. Um, I don't know if any, any of the Hong Kong veterans... Um, committed suicide after the fact. I'm not sure. Um, again, I didn't really get into much detail about that because again, limited scope of a dissertation, you can only do so much. Um, you can't do everything. And a lot of this stuff is not available, unfortunately. Um, we don't have the records, right? So maybe soon, they'll be soon. There'll be more stuff. I don't know. A lot of things are still, ac are still unaccessible, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, but again, I've read all kinds of accounts um, of the difficulties men were facing, people lost jobs. Uh, people would outright say, "Like I look okay on the outside." Again, I don't know; I wasn't there. But I, I constantly, you know, I think one was like ball of nerves, or I can't focus, I can't hold a job, I can't get in a promotion because I can't focus, or I can't do it, I can't put in the hours, like you know, all that kind of thing. Um, that's a part of my dissertation. I talk about that, um, where they uh, uh, did it a uh, uh, interviews with um, a lot of the vets when they were trying to get benefits uh, from the Japanese government, another topic that's controversial um, and still kind of unresolved. Uh, they started in the 1980s to ask the Japanese government to pay, pay more. They initially had paid, uh, I would still even say today, by the numbers of piddly sum, uh, and it came from the Canadian government from seized Japanese assets taken during the war. And it was hardly anything for what they went through. So they wanted an official apology from the Japanese government, which they didn't get until only a few years ago. And it's kind of a half apology, in my opinion. No financial uh, support. Eventually, the Canadian government did give them all, uh, all the veterans who had survived and their widows a payment uh, years and years later. Most of them had passed away. 
so it did no good for them for the men who suffered uh, which is to me unacceptable uh, and again this is not a political thing this is under i think it was a conservative government at the time i think it was Mulroney when this was all happening so it's not like it's the liberals trying to hide this it's all governments it's 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 an unfortunate circumstance I, I try to stay off politics on this channel and twitter and everything but i think this is beyond politics this is all canadian governments since 1945 trying to sweep this under the rug and, and that can't stand in my opinion uh, it cannot stand um, and it's something we need to look at i mean again they're all gone there's only a few left one just died a few days ago which was really shocking i know they're not young men uh, but it's still, it still it hurt to read that that the last um, Winnipeg Grenadier had passed. Um, it, it was quite sad. Sorry, trying to get emotional. This stuff makes me quite emotional. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, so that that is, I think, a lesson, uh, particularly with everything going on uh, in today's world. Uh, I'll just say the word Afghanistan once. Uh, but lots of veterans from that one. We need to support them properly. This is a lesson of Hong Kong. Uh, and reading these books, I think, and I hope. That that's what you will also take um, in your own way. Uh, again, not trying to direct you in any way to think a certain way, but that's just something that I think is very important. So that kind of leads into the next one, um, the next book, which I, uh, I I I want to talk about this one a little more because a it's the newest book. Um, it's from 2011, I do believe. Again, it's in the description, which I don't have in front of me. Uh, it's it's an interesting one. Um, I have not met uh, Mr. Greenfield. Um, I think he lives in the Ottawa area. I'm not sure. Uh, he used to teach Algonquin, uh, which is I live across the street from. Uh, so anyway, uh, he he wrote. It's fairly good. It's good. It's new. Uh, a lot of new sources in there that had not been used in kind of a book format uh, or book length project, if you will. Uh, it's got some issues. Um, every book does. Uh, this one is kind of older in its style. So. Um, how do I say this? So uh, if any of you are familiar with kind of the historiography of Hong Kong, um, there was a series in the early 90s called The Valor and the Horror. Yeah, uh, if you know that one, <laughs> it's uh, problematic. There is a Hong Kong episode, and it's just kind of indicative of how a lot of Canadians view the Hong Kong episode. Canada was duped into sending troops. Uh, they weren't trained at all, should have been nowhere near a battlefield. Um, I'll do something on that later. So this is about the books, but a little context is important. Um, so that's kind of the way the Canadian literature had been developed on the battle in the 1980s on through. Uh, numerous books on this that I do not think are very good, um, and I'm not going to mention them. Uh, but Greenfields kind of has that sort of same tradition, uh, but in an updated and better way. Um, I'm sure some of you are aware of the phrase, the poor bloody infantry. Uh, that's kind of what this book does, uh, just like a lot of the older ones. Um, kind of, you know, uh, the infantry suffered. Uh, they were at the hands of the general, the stupid generals who sent them to die, that kind of thing. Uh, no, Greenfield is not as to some extent as the others. Uh, his is a good book. Uh, there are some factual errors that happens, some interesting interpretations. Um, my one biggest critique is I don't think he spent enough time discussing the decision. A new book, yes, I know it's talking about experiences, literally in the title. I get that. But I think when you talk about Hong Kong, it is unavoidable because it frames how all of this goes. He could have spent a little more time talking about why they were sent and kind of what the troops kind of look like and their training and everything that they had gone through uh, before this. I think that's a huge part of this. Uh, but he does a fairly good job. Um, and one of the more interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, I should have a drink of water here. One of the more interesting elements to me is his discussion with, uh, about um, Brigadier Cedric Wallace. Sorry, this is the best picture I got. Uh, so he was uh, in command in Hong Kong of one of the Indian Army units for years. Uh, I can't remember which one. Uh, but then he's made to be in command of the, one of the brigades, the East Brigade, which before that was the Mainland Brigade at Hong Kong. Um, so once the battle starts, uh, the Canadian, the two Canadian infantry battalions are split up. The Winnipeg Grenadiers go to the west under command of Canadian Brigadier uh, J.K. Lawson. And the Royal Rifles in Canada are under uh, Cedric Wallace's 
uh, command. Uh, and yes, he didn't lose an eye in the First World War, um, hence the eye patch. Uh, but uh, so again, I don't want to go into the details too much because that's not really what I'm here to do. But um, he writes in the POW years his account. Sorry, Wallace writes his account of what happened. Uh, he outright accuses the Canadians of near mutiny. Uh, he wants to launch a counterattack, um, which ends up happening by the Canadians, uh, as not wanting to do it. He makes a big to-do about them, you know, not wanting to do it, and that's why it fails. Uh, to me, he uses the Canadians as scapegoats, and Greenfield agrees. So Greenfield, I don't think he's active with this anymore, but it's part of the book and the website connected to it. Uh, he wanted the British government, excuse me, to distance themselves from Wallace's account of the fighting, which I've read, used in the dissertation. It is. It, it, it doesn't match up with other accounts. It doesn't match with the conditions. Uh, there's all kinds of things going here. He was a regular Indian British Army officer, so he has a career to protect after the war. And that's what he did with, with his account of the fighting. Um, so Greenfield wants them to basically disown it. Um, I don't think they have. They haven't said anything about it since then. I don't think Greenfield's pushing for that anymore uh, in any real active way because uh, I think he's moved on to other projects. Um, but uh, it's an interesting dynamic. Again, I talk about this in the dis dissertation, this whole episode uh, between um, the commander, uh, the Canadian commander at the time in the area, uh, Price, who I've talked about in other areas, uh, and Wallace. And again, it's a very difficult episode to understand. I can't really do it on the live stream, but it is in my dissertation, which you can find easily. I post it on Twitter. Um, you can just plug it in, put in my name, Hong Kong, it comes right up. Um, so you can find that. But uh, it's a very complicated, but very interesting episode. And I think it's worth looking at uh, because it under it's part of how we understand this battle today. Uh, so I think it's worth a read. So I would start, if you don't know much about this stuff, I would start with Greenfield's book, which I have uh, links to buy in the description below. Uh, and I'll speak about that very briefly. So um, if you do buy through those links, it helps me immensely because I get a small portion uh, as a commission. Now I am still trying to make my careers kind of this online digital historian, if you will. So these little amounts are huge to me. Uh, they help me immensely because uh, I can keep doing this. If I if I have to do other things, I can't keep doing these this work. Uh, and I am kind of coming, sorry, not trying to make it a boo-hoo story, but uh, coming to a, a kind of a nexus uh, uh, of what to do next. Uh, so I need some help. Uh, so if, you could, if you're interested in these books, I highly recommend buying them, um, whatever's best for you. But if you could do it through those links, it helps me immensely. Um, so, so if you are interested in it, please do. Um, but again, I do recommend Greenfield's book. It's kind of like a starting point. Maybe, you know, you know, do Endicott's book, kind of get the overall sense of it. And then I would jump into Greenfield's for the Canadian story, because it's um, a good overview uh, of what's going on, what happens, the big events, that kind of thing. He talks about the battle in depth, which I very much appreciate because there, there wasn't really an, just an outright terrible book that had done that before. So, so Greenfield is a good place to start with that. So I highly recommend it for that reason alone. Uh, and the POW stuff is quite good. I've spoken with others who, who have some issues with the POW stuff. Um, but again, I, that's not my main focus and hasn't been. Um, and I don't know in detail uh, as well as the person I was speaking with uh, about this. Uh, but they, they said there's some issues. But just kind of, again, I think with any of these books or any book in general, just grain of salt, think a little critically about it. So that's Greenfield's book. Canadian uh, perspective, even though I believe he is American by birth, but Canadian perspective uh, about that. And it's the most recent book written on Hong Kong from kind of a Canadian perspective. Um, so I'm not sure when the next one will be, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know if it'll be from me. I don't know. Uh, I didn't, I don't know. I did want to talk about this very briefly. I'm not sure. Um, we'll see what happens, but uh it's just a lot going on for me. So I'm not sure I'd love to, but again, I just don't know if it's in the cards. Uh, anyway, not another part of this up story. So next one, and this one I recommend the most. If you're going to take away one book, it's this one. Sorry again about the glare. So not the slightest chance, Defense of Hong Kong, 1941, Tony Bannum. Now Bannum holds a PhD history, uh, done in Hong Kong, I believe. 
uh, his knowledge of this stuff is like seems superhuman to me and that's what this book is it, it's not a typical um like manuscript near like all that kind of thing so he goes into very different way of looking at the battle um, so he does background about Hong Kong and its connection in the empire and all that good stuff. Uh, what causes the war in the East, um, the battle itself. Uh, but what he does is he does it day by day, literally every day of the battle from December 8th all the way through to Boxing Day, pretty non-Empire, that is December 26th, <laughs> uh, when all the mass number of the troops have already have already surrendered. I mean, they're stragglers for a couple days and weeks afterwards, but that's the majority of them when they had surrendered. Uh, so, so there's that. Uh, so he does this day by day, and he looks at everything. I mean, everything. Like, I'm talking, like, by the minute almost in certain cases. Like, hour by hour. He's finding out what's happening, who was killed, which... And I looked at some of this, and it's on point. Like, it matches up with any new stuff I was able to find, because I believe this book is from 2001. So even new stuff I found matches up, which... Oh, sorry, 2003. My apologies. Or it might have been just this copy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Early 2000s. So it's amazing. Like, it's not going to read like a book. In some cases, that might be better, because he is cutting through as much of the bias as he can. And it's amazing. Like, I mean, this thing is just mind-blowing to read. Um, like, he covers everything. Like, tiny details. Like, um, and I wrote about this. I forgot to link it, but I will. Uh, I wrote an article about the fifth columnist, kind of like guerrilla warfare kind of stuff uh, at Hong Kong. Uh, but uh, anyway, so he talks about, like, tiny little one grenade being chucked at an outpost or something. Like, it's 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 crazy. Like, it's, it's so good. Like, I can't stress this book enough like anyone who wants to write on hong kong has to use this book if you don't you're missing out and your book will be your book your article whatever will be incomplete you need this work now i haven't done every instance right i haven't gone through everything but everything i did go through on point lines up with everything i found new accounts that he didn't use it lines up so it's, it's amazing. Like, and he literally does like who dies when and where, which is amazing because you don't normally get that, right? I've done that a little bit myself for a few other projects that I don't think are out yet or, or it might not be. Uh, anyway, and it's so difficult. And this is like, it's amazing. Like, it's amazing. It's the best way I think we can tell these men's stories is to understand what happened to them. And I think ben, Tony would agree with me. Tony Bannon, Mr. Bannon would agree. Sorry, Dr. Bannon would agree. Uh, and because that's what he did. And he wrote about that, you know, saying like, uh, the best I can do is understand what happened to these men and know their stories. And it's just, he covers everybody. It, it's like, so you might not be able to see it so well, but like, this is just one section of it. You know, it's, it's just the names of those who were killed. Like, it's crazy. Um, like it, it, it's, it's, it's something that must be looked at and, and, and it, like it's done day by day. So, right. You like, you read the descriptions that he's put together for say the 20th and then you can find at the end of that section who died that day, where as best as he can and what unit and everything it's, 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 it's mind boggling to me that he was able to do this. I think someone described it as like a labor of love that he did this. And I'm so thankful that he did because it, it's amazing. I mean, and there's uh, appendices about, you know, military equipment, anything and everything. So if you're interested in this, if you're writing on this, if you find this video, I don't know, a couple months from now, writing on a paper about this stuff or an article, use this book and your paper will be much better. Can't recommend it enough. It's probably the tops until I write mine. <laughs> Just kidding, because I might not write one. Uh, but anyway, so so that's the last book that I recommend right now. I might do another show where I look at things a little differently. But these are the ones that I think are a good place to start. Because um, it's kind of the path I took. Came to these sources at different times. Um, well, thanks, Angela. That'd be great. Yeah, check them out. Get them where you can if you can't get them through me, because I know you live in the U.S. Uh, but uh, get it if you can. It's amazing. Um, it's it's great. It's definitely worth it. If you're interested in Second World War, it's worth it. Because I, I don't know too many books like this. It, it's an amazing book. Um, 
Anyway, so yeah, so these books I think will help understand several different areas. Um, Bantam also wrote a historiography piece, um, which I think is missing a bit, um, but I don't want to talk about that. But I'll link it so you can check that out because it's got the most updated stuff. Other than my own work, but his is a little easier to get through because it wasn't a dissertation. Uh, that's not what it was designed to do. So uh, mine was designed to be a kind of academic-y, which uh, has got its problems. Uh, but anyway, so um, that's my recommendations. Start with, um, I like going in chronological order because that's how historiography works. I'd start with Endicott, and then I would move to Green uh, Greenfield. Uh, read the memoirs when you can. They're not very long. Definitely worth a read. And then Bantams you can read on its own all the way through snippets. You can read one day at a time. You can read his cause. What do you think the causes of the war are? What, uh, uh, you know, element of Hong Kong defense plays into all of this, which influenced my work greatly. Uh, I'll say that right now because it's true. There's a whole chapter on Hong Kong defense that I could not, I had to write. It had to be included. And it's because of Bantam. So, so a quite owed um, to Dr. Bantam about all of this, but uh Anyway, so everyone, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it wasn't too uh, rambly. Um, it's a really important topic to me, as you can probably tell. Um, spent five, six years of my life on this. Uh, and this is just kind of scratching the surface. But that's kind of what I wanted to do. Um, let's talk about some general things, where you could start if you're not too aware of all these things. Uh, kind of a little bit of the historiography, because I think that's important to understand. Uh, big part of this. Um, so yeah, that's that. That's there. So check out all the links I have in the description. I'll be adding some more probably right now. Uh, things I forgot, like my article, which I think is a different look at things. Uh, some stuff from Bantam. Um, oh yeah, Eastern Fortress as well. I will include that. Uh, and again, if you like what you saw, please subscribe. Every subscriber helps me immensely. Um, I need to get to a thousand for just different reasons. Uh, it helps me do more with the channel, basically. I can't do that until I get a thousand subscribers. Uh, also, um, if you like my work, um, you can support me through Patreon. The link is below, as well as buy me a coffee. Patreon, you can do as little as three fifty Canadian per month, and buy me a coffee five bucks, five Canadian bucks for you non Canucks is cheaper. <laughs> For most of you, uh, really helps. Any tiny, tiny bit helps me push, keep pushing uh, to do this. So, uh, so, so please, uh, please help if you can. Uh, I, I appreciate every tiny little bit of help I can get. Uh, so, subscribe uh, and uh, like the video. Please share this if you enjoyed it, or even if you didn't, please share <laughs> because I'm sure someone will find value of this somewhere down the road um, because um, there's just not that much discussion about Hong Kong and the books and all that fun, fun stuff. So uh, so uh, thanks, Willie. Thanks, Angela, for watching. Anyone else out there watching as well, thank you for tuning in. Anyone in the future, I hope you found this useful about the books of Hong Kong. So I'm going to sign off and say thanks again. Brad from On This Day in Canadian Military History, thanks for watching.